That's what we're going to talk about today is your passion. Because where your treasure is, there your heart is. And so I want you to think with me today about what is your treasure. Uh, Did you get this book? I hope most of you picked it up. We ran out of them, and I'm sorry. We ordered over 200 of them, and we ran out. So I know a few people may not have gotten them, but I know you can pick them up at Lifeway or Mardell's or other places. But today we are on the sixth of a series. So today is the last week. And let me just remind you of what we've talked about, because Tom Rainer in this book about I Am a Church Member talks about what it means to be a biblical church member. Now, there are all kinds of people who attend churches, right? I mean, some are seekers, some are there because they're afraid if they don't show up, God's going to get them. Uh, Some have been forced to come by their spouse or their parents. Uh, Some uh, just had nothing else to do and uh, felt like maybe I could just show up and and maybe fit in. But but the, the hope is that we become biblical church members that have Christ attitude in our life and so we begin to say like Jesus I love my church now we've got to clarify what church is because church is not the building amen although the buildings belong to God and they're a gift from God church is not the pews it is not the program it's not the style it's not the activity although those are things we do just as my house is not my family My car is not my family. We may travel in it, we may use it, but it's a gift from God for the family. All those things are the trappings. The church is you. If you have come to know Jesus and he has made you part of his family. So when we say I love my church, we're talking about loving God's family. Loving the people of God. Loving the followers, the fully devoted followers of God. And we're talking about having an attitude. In other words, how do you look at life? See, some people look at life very negatively. And everything is always half empty and there's always problems and they're just caught up in that and they cannot enjoy life because they're so pulled into that attitude. Some people's attitude is that in order to protect themselves, they're always pointing out the faults of others. Some people's attitude is to attack other people, and that somehow gives them some kind of pleasure. That's what we see with terrorism in our world today. But God's attitude is that it would be Christ-like. Paul would write in Philippians, have this attitude in you that was also in Jesus Christ. To have a Christ attitude. So week one, we talked about biblical church members serve. In other words, nobody was ever called to be part of the family to sit, to soak, to watch. Everybody was called to be part of the family to find out how they can help and serve and take care of others. The second week we looked at how, as part of the family, we are to be a unifying force. The sad reality in our nation today is at minimum 50% of churches are plateaued and declining. Every year there are forced terminations and there are divisions that are happening among people who claim to follow God. And so there are a lot of people who are disruptive and not unifying. But in a family, we want husband and wife to be unifying. We want the children to be unifying, the parents to help unify. And in the church, that's what Jesus said. In fact, in John 17, over and over, I came that you might be one. As the Father and I are one, you might be one. The third week, we looked at this idea that so many times we think of a country club mentality, and so church is what I want. My style, my temperature, my place, my colors, my preferences. But that is not biblical Christianity. That is all about status. And Jason did a great job that week talking about we're to stand in Jesus Christ. We're to stand with Jesus Christ. We are to want what he wants and to be like him. So that it's not about my selfishness and my preferences. It's about what does God want. And you know one of the main things God wants He's not willing that any should perish. He wants me to sacrifice my life to help somebody else come to know him. And then the fourth week, we talked about prayer, how important it is to pray for one another and how important it is for you to pray for your leaders, the Bible teacher who teaches you, the leader of a group who leads you, those on our staff who are called as pastors to help shepherd us, to pray for the leaders and to pray for one another. Last week we set up four chairs and talked about that biblical church members lead their family 
to grow in Christ. So we lead them from step by step, from the seeker chair to the saved chair to the disciple chair to the disciple maker chair. We keep moving step by step to know where you are and where your family is and help lead them to be more of what God wants. Today we're in the last chapter, chapter 6, and it's all about what do you treasure. And Tom Rainer talks about how we need to have an attitude that treasures the family of God. He starts off by telling us a story. It's a great story about little Johnny. And little Johnny's got a choice. Here's scene one. Scene one is mom comes to little Johnny and says, little Johnny, I want you to clean up your room. You're part of this family. You need to clean up your room. You need to get rid of all the dust, all the dirt. You need to work and have this room spotless and perfect. That's scene one. Little Johnny begins to think, man, it's going to take me a long time to get all of this cleaned up. And then he says, his mom comes to little Johnny and says, here's scenario number two. Little Johnny, somebody's going to come by today and they're going to bring you a gift. They're going to bring you a very special gift. In fact, it's going to be the best gift you've ever gotten in your life. Now, which scenario do you think little Johnny wants? I mean, duh, right? I mean, clean your room or get a gift. But Rainer points out that's the exact difference in the attitude that we take towards church. How do you view church? How do you think of being part of his church? Do you think of it as an obligation? When you begin to think about church, is it an obligation of what you, oh, we got to get up on Sunday. We have to get up on Sunday and go. We have to give. We have to do something. We have to show up. We have to drag everybody there. It's an obligation. It's like cleaning the house. It's something you have to do. Is that the way you look at church? Or do you look at church as more of a place, kind of like your room or your house? And if we're going to survive, well, we've got to have everything in the right place, and you've got to be in the right place. And, and, and we get mad at people if they get our place or if it messes up our place, or, or we only think about the place. Some churches even get so much enthralled with the place that they forget that the people are supposed to go outside of the place in missions. Or do we look at it as a gift? Do we look at it that, hey, someday somebody's going to come and give you the greatest gift you've ever been given? And that gift is a gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Do you remember a time when that happened in your life? Do you remember a time when somebody knocked on the door of your heart and said, I've got a gift for you. If you will trust me, if you will believe in me, if you will receive me as the Son of God who died on the cross, if you will give me your sin, I will give you the greatest gift you've ever had. You see, sometimes we only think of salvation in terms of, okay, I don't go to hell, I go to heaven. But that's not what salvation is. Salvation is a relationship with God which made us part of his family. So when we got saved, we became part of the church, the family that Jesus died for. That means the greatest gift you ever were given was to be part of this family that on earth is going to love each other and serve and minister and do things. But one day when you die, guess what? You still are part of his family around his throne in heaven, oh glorious day, oh glorious day, amen? Were you singing that? I hope you were singing that. Do you ever stop and think, one of these days there's not going to be any more cancer, not any more allergies, not any more cedar trees blowing in, not any more snow and ice, not any more conflicts, not any more fights in the family, not any more children that rebel, parents that abandon, uh, older senior adults that have illness, all of that's going to be gone. Oh, glorious day. He's coming back, and we're going to be with him forever in heaven because we're part of his family. And God wants family to be with him. Don't you like family to be with you? At least most of the time. And we're still on earth where it's an imperfect world, right? If you have your Bibles, look at Matthew chapter 6 with me. We're going to look at two passages today. One is in Matthew 6, the words of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. We could also look in Luke or we could look in Mark. 
but we're going to look in Matthew to make it easy to find. And then we're going to flip over a few more pages, or if you're watch, looking on your iPhone or iPad, uh, you can go on to chapter 13 in a minute. In chapter 6, we have the Sermon on the Mount. So in chapter 5, 6, and 7, those three chapters, Matthew gives this great sermon of Jesus. In fact, when we look in the Gospel of Matthew, he's got five great messages where the king goes up on a hill and he speaks to us. Matthew loves that idea. Matthew, as he writes his gospel, it's all about Jesus is the king. Now, when Luke writes, it'll be a different emphasis. Mark will write about it. Jesus is the son of man. And, and, and then John will write more about he's the son of God, the I am. So each gospel gives a little different picture. But here in Matthew, we've got the king. He goes up on the mountain and he, he starts telling them. He sits down on the throne on the mountain and he begins to tell them, this is the kind of people who follow me. This is what it means to be a biblical Christian who follows me, a Christian like Christ. This is what it means. When he comes to chapter 6, verse 19, look at what he says about treasures. Because that's what I want to really talk to you today about. What do you treasure? Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth. In English, we don't use the double negative, but in, in Greek, they did. So the word would have been ou, which is negative, no, me, which is negative. So he would have said, no, never, this is not the way to live. A double negative, meaning never, never, no, no. It's kind of like when you tell a little kid, and you, you can't just tell them once. You've got to tell them, no, don't do this. Please don't do this. He says, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth. Why? Because moth and rust will destroy it, and thieves will break in and steal but store up, here's the command, the imperative, store up for yourself treasures in heaven where the moth and the rust cannot destroy it and where thieves cannot break in and steal. Now, underline this verse. I, I don't know if you like to underline, but this is a verse to underline. This is a major verse that Jesus gives us, a major truth. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What you treasure is what captures your heart. So if you get on the computer and start looking at the wrong things and you begin to invest time and energy and attention into something, it will capture your heart. If you begin to treasure telling lies or half-truths, it will capture your heart. If you begin to like the idea of destroying other people's lives, it will capture your heart. Somebody asked me not long ago, they said, how in the world could some, place, uh, some group like ISIS or ISIL, how could they capture the hearts of young people and children to come and join them in this murderous, evil, wicked, terrible uh, 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 journey of destroying life? Because when you begin to invest your treasure, that is your time, your energy, your attention, your resources, when you begin to treasure something, then maybe you could join a group that's making a difference in the world, that's in the news all the time, that has some agenda, that's coming together with some vision, some goal. You begin to treasure it. It captures your heart. That's why the Bible warns us so much. That money is not bad unless you fall in love with it, right? When money becomes your treasure and you start storing up all kinds of things and you've got to protect it and you've got to hoard it and you've got to hold on to it, it captures your heart. And then you show up in church and the preacher mentions giving and you're like, ah, that's all they ever talk about is giving at church. We don't talk about it that much, really. But what you treasure is what? becomes your passion. So I thought I would ask you on social media, I would ask, what do you treasure? And I got on our uh, church page and on my page and several other people that copied in and emailed me, I probably got 40 or 50 answers from you. You know what you said you treasure the most? One word came out is the thing that the most people said they treasure. Anybody want to guess? Well, we're in church, so God is always a good answer, right? 
It's like the little preschool class that was meeting, and the teacher said, you know, who swallowed Jonah? And said, Jesus! <laughs> she said, Jesus? Well, Jesus is always the right answer. So, you said family. That was the number one answer that nearly everybody put in their response, and by far the most family. Why? Because family are the people we live with, the people we love, the people we treasure, the people we think about all the time. In fact, for me, I agree completely with that. 30 years ago, I walked down an aisle in a church in Dallas, and I said I do to a lovely lady sitting right over here named Lisa. She would put a funky picture of me on Facebook today, but... <laughs> But over 30 years, I have treasured her and the life together. And then God gave us three boys, and we began to treasure them. And then I want you to see, look at this picture. Now that's the treasure I have in the third generation. The little guy sitting there is Dakota's little boy. Kip, uh, I mean, it's uh, Kobe's little boy, Kipton. And the other one pointing at the animal is Logan, Dakota's little boy. For just a year and a half, I can't tell you how much I treasure them, how much I love to see them, how much I love to hear them say, Pops. Why? Because it's family. And you love family. They are part of your life, part of your blood, part of what you treasure. So if we know that in life, if family stands out, what do you think God treasures? What do you think God treasures? Family. Isn't that wonderful? In fact, when he reveals himself, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three in one, family. When he creates us, male, female, go multiply, family. When he calls Abraham, Come, follow me. I will make you a nation. I will make you the father of nations. I will make you over the families of the earth. In the New Testament, when someone got saved, you know what word they used in Philippians and other places? They used the word oikos because it said when somebody got saved and their oikos. Oikos is the word for house or family. So when somebody got saved, they didn't just get saved. When the Philippian jailer got saved, he goes home, tells his wife about Jesus, tells the children about Jesus, tells all the servants who work with them, and they all get saved and they all get baptized. Why? Because if I have a treasure, i got to share it with the people that I treasure. And they all in family got saved. What is the greatest burden that a Christian ought to have is when someone in their family is hurting or someone in their family is not saved. Why do we care about each other? Because we're part of family. Family. Do you treasure the family? Because I treasure Lisa, I made a commitment not to say ugly things about her. Not ever, if possible, and especially not in public. Because that's just not appropriate for family, is it? I may sit down with one of my kids and talk to them, but I'm not going to go and tell you, and I'm certainly not going to put on social network something negative about my family. That's just not appropriate. That's dysfunctional. That's codependent. That's evil. And I'm sure not going to attack you because you're part of my family. If I have a concern with you, I need to sit down and talk with you. I need to come to you one-on-one. -on -one. In fact, that's what Jesus taught us, didn't he? Because we are to treasure family. And when we treasure family, that's where our heart is. And when our heart is there, we begin to love them. I would do anything for these boys, even give my life, sell everything I have. Because they're part of my family. And I've noticed something about family. Family is not usually focused on the oldest members because the oldest members are supposed to be mature enough to be pouring their life into the younger members who are pouring their life into the younger members. So we poured our life into our kids. Now they poured it into the grandkids. And I like the grandkids better than the kids. <laughs> and I like the kids. But that should be the way family is too, right? It's not about me and what I need. It should be about the younger ones. And the babies, 
And are we raising them up? Are we loving them in the family? Why? Because they're the most vulnerable. They're the most in, uh, able to be influenced, and, and they're impressionable. And we want to love them. So what did Jesus love? He said, watch out, because what you treasure will become your heart. Turn to chapter 13. This is an awesome chapter. In chapter 13, Jesus in his perfection does another sermon, and in that sermon he gives seven pictures, seven pictures of the kingdom. Now the kingdom is where the king rules. In other words, the king is the leader over the family of those who follow him. So the kingdom is where those who follow the king live. And so when he begins to talk about this kingdom thing in chapter 13 and the mysteries of the kingdom, he's talking about how he is going to set up his kingdom and he's going to come as he did and die for us. He's going to go and then he's going to come back to bring to fruition and to fulfill the desire of the kingdom. And so he has seven parables. If you look at the pictures up here, it kind of shows you these. The first one he talks about in the very first of the chapter is how a sower goes out and sows seed. And he says as the seed is the word of God, he goes out and sows. And depending on where the seed falls, it grows. In the second picture he says, yes, the sower sows, but during the night a wicked neighbor comes and sows weeds into the field. So now we have the wheat and the weeds growing side by side. And then he gives a third picture of how the very smallest seed, a little mustard seed, looks like a little grain of pepper, can be planted, and that small seed can grow like the kingdom, starting with one death and resurrection, and can grow into a great tree, and that tree grows to bear fruit, but even birds, wicked, dirty, smelly birds, can come and sit in the branches of the tree You ever had a door facing or something where a bunch of birds had been sitting very long? They make a mess, don't they? You do not want to sit under a bunch of birds. But the kingdom will grow, and yeah, there'll be birds sitting in the trees, messing on it. And then he says, it's like dough that someone is kneading, and a little bit of leaven gets in, and it just begins to expand. And then he says it's like a treasure hidden in a field. And then he says it's like a pearl that a merchant finds of great value. And then the seventh picture, he says, it's like a net that's thrown out and draws in all the fish. And when they're all drawn in, the angels sit down and help sort out the good fish from the bad fish. And that's the end of that period of time. These seven things happening. I want you to look in verse 44. I want you to focus with me. What does Jesus treasure? And in the fifth and the sixth picture, he gives us this picture. Look in verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Now some people have said, oh well, that treasure must be salvation. We need to go sell everything. No, no, no. He's talking about the kingdom. The kingdom is where God rules. It's the time from his resurrection until he comes back to take us home on that glorious day. So what's he talking about? Well, all we have to do is look at the rest of the chapter. Who is the man? It's Jesus. He's the sower. He's the farmer. He's the one throughout the entire passage. And what does he do? He comes into the field. What is the field? Well, already he told us in the other parable, the field is the world. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In John 1, 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. So this man, Jesus, came into the field, which is the world, and why did he come? Well, he told us already to seek and to save that which is lost. He was looking for you and looking for me. And when he came into the world, he found us. But we weren't yet revealed as a treasure to the rest of the world. We were buried. So what did he do? He went and he sold everything in order that he could purchase this world back to God. You know what Jesus is saying? This is what the kingdom is all about. The king came looking for you and looking for me because you 
are the treasure. You are the treasure. That's, that's what Rebecca was singing about, isn't it? When I begin to think how awesome God is, and I begin to think God is for me, God considers me to be a treasure. Yes, he came to find us, to seek and to save us because we are the treasure hidden in the world, in the field. <clears throat> he gave everything. He gave his position of coming from heaven to earth. He came and he walked among us. And then he died on that cross. Earlier you saw the beautiful picture across here of Jesus on the cross. In a few weeks we'll celebrate how he died and on resurrection how he rose from the dead. He came as that treasure. He gave himself to buy that treasure. And when he rose from the dead, he said, go and wait until the Holy Spirit comes on you. And when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you shall receive power. And the treasure begins to be revealed. So at Pentecost, there's 3,000 saved. And then every day, there's more saved. And now 2,000 years later, guess what? That hidden treasure is still being revealed. Every time someone comes to know Jesus, every time you trust somebody, somebody else, that hidden treasure is revealed to the world. And it's being polished by God through oftentimes struggles and suffering, that it's being revealed that you are the treasure. And Jesus says when he comes back, he will make up his jewels. You are the treasure. So what does God treasure? He treasures you. That's why his heart is for you. That's why he loves you. Because no matter how tarnished, how corrupt, have you ever seen one of those ships that wrecked and sunk and all the coins that are deep in the water and they're still precious gold coins, but they're covered over with barnacles and with soot and with, with corrosion? We may look like that, but that treasure, though it's hidden, is being revealed because he paid the price to buy us back. And so you are the treasure. Now, if Jesus treasures you, shouldn't you treasure one another? Shouldn't I look at you as a precious gift and treasure from God? Even if we don't always agree, if we don't always get along, even if we don't always have the same type of desires, maybe you like coconut pie and I prefer chocolate. But we are treasures. Then he turns to 45 and 46 and he says, hey, there's a merchant. Who's the merchant? That's Jesus again. What's he looking for? He's looking for the pearl of great price. Do you know how a pearl is formed? You have a sea creature that gets a speck of foreign material. We might say that's sin, right? Here you are in the ocean, you're living your life, everything's fine. As long as nobody comes along and has oysters on the half shell or something, you're just enjoying life. But all of a sudden, a speck gets in there, a piece of dirt or sand. Something gets in there that's a foreign object. And in order for you to deal with it, you begin to coat it with your own fluids. You begin to coat it with your own fluid, and you coat it, and you coat it. The only problem is the more you coat it, the bigger it gets, and the more you coat it, the more precious it becomes. You basically give your life to coat this foreign object so that it no longer is there and something to look ugly and destructive. It now becomes what throughout Christianity has been a picture of the church. That because of our sin, Jesus went to the cross in order that we could be covered in his blood. So instead of being an ugly piece of sin, we could be made into a precious pearl and how by his suffering because any good thing requires suffering doesn't it in order for a mother like Kim this week and Eric to have a new little baby Mason she had to go through the pain of delivery in order sometimes to have healing there must be that in order to raise children there must be some suffering and in order to live life we're all going to suffer. But when we suffer in a good way, sacrificing ourselves the way Jesus did, it begins to coat and the church becomes the pearl of great price. So when we get to heaven, the gates are made of these pearls. Why? 
that God is picturing that through the suffering of his blood, he has turned something terrible, our sin, into something beautiful, a pearl that reflects his beauty and his glory. And again, he says, in the end of time, I will gather my jewels. And like a necklace, he'll put us on as a string of pearls. What does Jesus treasure? He treasures you. And if he treasures you, you ought to treasure not only him, but you ought to treasure the church as his family. And when we do, we begin to be biblical church members. Because I value the church, and so I want to meet with my family every week. I value the church, so I want to help my family. I want to minister. I want to give of my resources, give of my talents and abilities, like Rebecca and the praise team and the musicians. I want to serve like those in the, in the balcony that help with all of the things that may never be seen, but they're serving in order that I might show my love. Because where my treasure is, there my heart is. So look at this next picture. Here's, here's a picture of our church a few years ago. We took a picture out there. That's the church, the people. And biblical church members treasure the people that are part of this church. We pray for one another. We love one another. We minister to one another because that's what we treasure. I really treasure our staff. We have some phenomenal people and uh, that means it hurts me when people say things that aren't nice about our staff because that should never happen. Uh, what those people saying that don't usually know is they, like all of us, they have a limited picture of things. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I can remember a few times getting mad at somebody, then I found out the rest of the story and I understood what they were going through or where they were or, or I knew how much they did or what all. But I really appreciate John, John is our worship pastor, but he has such a passion for the Word that every Tuesday morning, he's up here by 6 a.m. to meet with a bunch of guys who meet here for Bible study before they ever leave to go to work. That takes some commitment. I mean, especially this week with time change. I don't know if you had suffered it, but getting up Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday was kind of hard adjusting to that time change. They're going through this book. It's about seven great men. It starts with Washington and then uh, uh, Wilberforce who fought the uh, battle in Europe for uh, the freedom of the slaves. And then the third chapter is the one we covered this week. And I thought, this third chapter is a great picture of this. It's a story of a guy named Eric Little. You probably know him if you ever saw the movie Chariots of Fire. Eric Little was an extremely talented young man he grew up in a missionary family, and he had a desire to make a difference in the world, but God made him fast. He could run an incredible speed. And as he trained and as he was there in Britain preparing for the Olympics in 1924, leading up to 1924 Olympics in Paris, he was an incredible runner, and the more they watched him, they said, this guy is so fast, he will win the gold medal in the 100, he will win the gold medal in the 220, he will win those without any question. There was very little doubt because he was so good. And when he led some of the trials leading up to it, he, he outran everybody, and they were just incredible. Even on one race, he got tripped at the start and fell. And in a short race, if you stumble or trip, you're not winning. He got up and still ran down the rest of the pack to win the race. He had an unusual style. If you ever saw the movie, I mean, he didn't run like they train you with your knees up and your arms swinging. I mean, he just kind of flailed and he put his head back and, and people would look at him and say, this guy can't win. But he was fast. And he said, God made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. But Eric was an extremely committed believer. In fact, he treasured his relationship with Jesus more than anything else in life, and therefore, he was very committed to worship on Sunday. When the schedule came out in Paris for the 1924 Olympics, the 100 was scheduled for trials. The qualifying trials would be on Sunday. He said, I can't do that. The Olympic team was unbelievably upset with him. You can imagine. His nation was a, what do you mean you can't do it? Come on, I mean, just one Sunday, just one Sunday, one Sabbath. He said, I can't do that. That would be to compromise what I treasure the most in my life is God and worshiping him. 
and I can't do one thing I like if it means compromising my treasure for God. And so instead of him running, Harold Abrahams ran. And guess what? Harold Abrahams wasn't expected to win, but he did. And because he couldn't run the 100, he was still on the Olympic team, he began to prepare to run the 400. But a 100 is a sprint, a 400 takes some endurance, and nobody thought he would win. But he was so convinced and so passionate of his love for God and treasuring that, even though it meant missing out on a gold medal, he said, I would rather honor God. If you saw the movie, when he lines up in the starting blocks, and it's fairly accurate, another person gives him a scripture out of Samuel, and it says, he who honors me, I will honor. You see, when you treasure God, and you know God treasures you, God honors you. He, he lined up on the 400. Now, the bad thing is, you know how they stagger the race? He got the outside lane which is the worst position in a race like that because now you're out in front of everybody. You think you're ahead of everybody until you get around the turn and all of a sudden everybody passes you. You, you can't chase somebody in the outside lane. You've got to have the right pass, the right pa uh, a pace or you're going to lose. So he gets the worst lane to run not his best race. When the gun goes off, he takes off. Everybody watching says he's blown it. He runs the 400 like you run the 100, he takes off in an all-out sprint. They said by the time he gets to the 200, he will die. He passes the 100 mark, he's still sprinting. He passes the 200 mark, he's still sprinting. He passes the 300 mark, and his head goes back, and he begins to flail, and he keeps running at the same pace, and he sets a world record. You know why he was able to run so fast? Because he treasured God. And where your treasure is, there your heart will be. He had a passion for God. That when you honor God, God will honor you. Would you pray with me? Father, give us that kind of a passion. Where we have treasured things that will not last, wood, hay, and stubble, and things of this world that are going to pass away, forgive us. And Lord, today, set our hearts and our passions upon the things you treasure. Lord, thank you that you treasure each person here. You love them with a never-ending love. And as we come to this time of invitation, we just want to come running to you, Lord, and say we love you because you love us. You are for us. And we look forward to that glorious day. We want to run every day of our lives in a way that we are honoring you, that we are treasuring your things. And so today, turn our hearts towards you. And as we fall in love with one another more and more, may we help one another, may we serve one another, may we pray for one another, may we encourage one another, may we minister to one another, may we lift each other up. And may we guard our hearts, lest the evil one should control our wicked mouths and we should speak evil things to the ones we love because we love you and we love one another. Oh God, that the world would see us and like those first Christians in Antioch, they'd say, my, how they love one another. Oh God, that we would be passionate for one another, passionate to come and worship, passionate to serve, passionate to pray. God, whatever you're saying to us, may we hear you today. And may we treasure you and treasure your family. Just a minute, we're going to stand, and when we stand, that'll be your time to come. I hope you won't slip out or leave. Rebecca's going to sing again at the end. You don't want to miss that, but you also don't want to distract anyone else today. If God is speaking to someone's heart, would you just say yes to him? Maybe you need to come and pray, or maybe you need to go to someone and say, you know what, I've not treated you as I should in the body. I've not treasured you the way I should. And so today, I just want to make it right. Maybe God's saying, hey, you need to grow in some area of love for Him. Would you just say yes to Him? When we stand, would you come? God's leading you to join the church. 
to follow in baptism, to surrender to service, to ask forgiveness, to seek the Lord, whatever he may be saying to you, whatever he may be doing in your heart, would you just let him have his way? Father, we come before you as we sing, this time belongs to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Let's stand together. Would you join our praise team in singing as God calls you closer to him?